222 to nothing, the most lopsided game in college football history. We talked to Jim Paul about college baseball ringers, church choirs, and a comic book advertisement as we delve into John Heisman's largest victory. They weren't supposed to have a team, so nobody at Cumberland knew about it except for the players. He wasn't a very big guy. Yeah. <laughs> Tech was big. <laughs> I found something on the Cumberland game and Watt was excited. And I said, Dad, look what I found. He goes, oh, I already saw that. And that's when he showed me, come out here, and he showed me the storage room just filled with boxes and boxes. And he hurried and hurried to get all this information, which is fantastic because it, it would have been gone forever. October 7th. 1916, a fall Saturday in Atlanta, Georgia. John Heisman was readying his Georgia Tech team to play Cumberland College in a football game that would go on to become the most lopsided football game in history. My name is Jim Paul, and I'm author of You Dropped It, You Picked It Up, a book about the highest scoring collegiate football game that ended in the score of 222 to zero. First off, it's a very improbable game. This game should have never taken place because Cumberland dropped football, and the score should have never been so high because Heisman never ran up to score anyone. I think you have to say the planets aligned. John Heisman, a legend in college football. He was the first coach to use the huddle, added a scoreboard in the stadium to help the fans, and... Football players had to be big and strong. Well, one of his teams, the first one he had, was they were real small and they were real fast, just the opposite. So he said, you know something, they come rushing in, off, just throw the ball over their head. You're fast enough, catch it. So he invented the forward pass. Heisman has a trophy named after him and is in the College Football Hall of Fame. But what about George Allen? the coach at Cumberland. If you were to go to Google, you might incorrectly find a George Allen who coached in the NFL in the 1970s. But that George Allen wasn't even born when this game was played. George, I guess at the time, he was very you know, naive, spontaneous, and he tried to think out of the box too much. <laughs> it seemed like he'd trip over the edge of the box and fall and hit his head because his ideas were really crazy. The man coaching Cumberland was a law student who loved football and was single-handedly trying to save Cumberland Athletics. George had a way of taking bad situations and making them worse. Uh, he, of course, he wasn't a fool because he went on to be an advisor for what, three or four different presidents. We know this because of his book. But at this point, he was a college kid facing off against, not only that, but an angry, The sports writers were selecting the national champion by the number of points a team would score in a season. And he wasn't kind of run up the score, and he liked to play the big leagues. You know, he wanted to play the best teams to prove he was the best. And when he took a lead, he put in the second, third strings and not run up the score. Well, other teams caught on and said, you know, we can schedule really, really weak teams run up the score, and we could win the national championships. And that strategy was winning, and that made Heisman angry. He said it, it was insulting the sport of football. He wanted to prove that the total number of points scored in a season didn't make you the best team. But who could he do that against? We'll have to go back more than a year before the game was actually played to find out how the matchup between a powerhouse and a school that no longer fielded a football team came to be. The stipulation for Cumberland to keep a football team in 1915 was that they had to have a faculty member supervising as coach. George scoured the campus and, you know, nobody wanted to do it, but he, it was this minister that volunteered his time at the church there. And this minister coached the football team and he also coached the baseball team. They were going to do a drill one time and he said, oh no, you can't do that, that's brutal. What would their mothers think? He just had them granny lobbing the ball back and forth or almost kind of like childhood games with the ball, you know. He didn't really know a lot about football and what football was about. And it did not go well. It probably should have ended there, but it didn't, because George Allen didn't give up easily. The acting president, it came in, and because they were in financial troubles while they dropped football, George was, somehow was able to convince him, said, look, if we can beat Georgia Tech in baseball, can we can have football next, just one more shot at football. 
And you know, the acting president knew enough about Georgia Tech was a great baseball team and Cumberland was really terrible. So um, he convinced, he said, look, if you can beat Georgia Tech, I'll give you one more football season. George just happened to know a coach who was a mile, um, an hour and a half away in Nashville at one of the professional teams. And he said, you know, I can get a professional team to dress out as Cumberland and they could beat Georgia Tech. They beat Georgia Tech really bad that morning, 22 to zero. And then after the professional players headed back to Nashville, they put on their jerseys, sat in the bleachers, and people showed up that afternoon. They showed them the scoreboard and said, look what we did, and they became heroes. So now, everything was looking up. Yay! Football was saved. Or was it? They played a scrimmage game, and um, they were beaten really bad, and they lost a lot of players. No! But the acting president said, no, we're doing right with football. Even though I gave you my word, I'll give you another season. You embarrassed me so bad. He said, I'm dropping football. But there was a problem the acting president was unaware of. Cumberland had a contract to play Georgia Tech in football in the 1916 season. Heisman had offered him $500, which was what, probably $10,000 in today's money. But uh, they thought, that's a lot of money. And they had a fraternity, uh, Sigma Nu fraternity, and they went, but we could party really well with that. So George used that money as a motivation to get a team together. And since he had this relationship with the minister already, because he had coached the year before, he said, you know, we can hide our team as a choir. So what they would do is they'd go in the chapel every day. The acting president would go home, and then when he's home, they would start practice. So that's how they hid their team. When people find out there, they were gathering together to practice. You're probably asking, how do we know all of this? Was there a chapter about it in George's book? The curiosity came from my father. Back in the late 1930s, he's a six or seven year old kid. He's reading a comic book. And there on the back of the comic book, there's a little fun fact about the Georgia Tech Cumberland game. And he says a little rough sketch of an old Tommy football player and a beat up scoreboard that had 222 to nothing. Well, as a six or seven year old kid that loved football, he got excited. So he ran and showed it to his dad and asked, if, can you find out more information about this? And his dad, I guess, used it as a teaching tool and taught him how to go to the library, look up stuff and um, you know, magazines, books. And even though they didn't find much, I think he said that summer they happened to have relatives in Atlanta, so they went to Atlanta, and they went to the Georgia Tech bookstore, some of the bookstores in Atlanta, and still didn't really find a lot. But his cousins there said, oh, we find articles all the time in the paper. So they started mailing to him. So this little kid, instead of collecting baseball cards, he's getting all these articles from his cousins. You know, he could go in the mailbox, excited, waiting for the next article to come in. And he said he collected like a cigar box full of these articles. Well, my dad started high school, he had an aunt who was an English professor at one of the universities, and she taught him about correspondence. And he would write letters, she taught him how to write the letters, who to send them to, and he would send them to Chamber of Commerce, to the um, archives at the different universities, to the newspapers, and he was starting to get back information from them, handwritten letters, typed letters, and he was able to collect shoe boxes full of information. So he's gone from that little you know, clip on the back of a um, car comic book to uh, a cigar box to a couple of shoe boxes full of information. My dad got back, I guess, the early 50s from fighting in the Korea War. That's when things really took off on the research because he went to work for a bank and they gave him the job of tracking down delinquent accounts. These people who would get these big loans and then they'd you know, head out of state, steal the money. Well, his job was to locate these people and he got really good at it. They gave him an instrument that made the difference, the telephone, unlimited access. So he said within a week or two, he could track down people that would have taken months if he'd got it by letter, you know, correspondence that way. And he got so good at it that they allowed him to stay after work and use their phone so that he could try to track down, you know, Cumberland players. Unlimited access to a telephone might not seem like a big deal now, but back then... If you pick up your phone this weekend for only 22 cents or less for the first minute, only 16 cents or less for each additional minute, so go ahead, spend a few moments with your family or friends. Dial and save while weekend rates apply. And he'd come home with these uh, old notebooks full of notes he had, and he'd tell us some of these stories where we're sitting at the you know, table eating, and if what these guys have told him that happened, it, it was hilarious. I think 90% of the stuff he got was never heard of before, and he got all this from all these players firsthand. It was early 70s when I got involved, and my dad showed me all this stuff he had accumulated, 
And I read that, you know, people are looking forward to being immortalized. And I said, Daddy, these people want you to make a book. And, he, and he, my dad pointed to all that stuff and he said, I can do this book I'm not sure about. And I said, I, I volunteered to help him. And we, we had a lot of fun working together. Jim's dad would come home from work and the family would sit at the dinner table while he shared stories of this crazy football game between Cumberland and Georgia Tech. How much time are you spending at the dinner table with your family? Maybe you'd be more inclined if you had a custom built table from tablesforgames.com. With the unique table topper design, you can eat dinner at the table and then remove the top to reveal a game playing service underneath. Each table is custom built and handcrafted. Do yourself a favor and check out tablesforgames.com. It's finally game day. John Heisman was still a Hall of Fame coach, and George Allen had a secret play calling system. No, he didn't invent this. And he gave each virtual person a vegetable name. So if he wanted the halfback turnip to run behind the blocking back cabbage, he'd say turnip over cabbage. So turnip would get the ball and run to cabbage's hole and cabbage would block for him. During the game, it's got so complicated. Uh, I think they abandoned that some way halfway through the game, but uh, that's how they started out. <laughs> On the kickoffs, they would kick off after Georgia Tech scored, and he said, well, maybe it will wear them out. They'd have further to go to score because, you know, Cumberland would get the ball, fumble it, and they'd only had 10 yards to go for a touchdown. He said, well, at least now they have the length of the field to go. An interesting idea for sure, but it didn't tire Georgia Tech out. Heisman had more players, and he always made sure that their conditioning was top-notch. They didn't need any motivation, but they had it. They divided the game into quarters. You know, Team A would go first quarter, Team B second, then the same thing in the second half. And he promised a steak dinner to the team that could score the most points. So that kind of became like a rallying cry. You could hear him going, steak, steak, steak. Not to be outdone, George began his own chant. Remember the $500. <laughs> that was their motivation. As the game wore on, the Cumberland squad was getting beat up. Players were hanging on to each other, you know, just to stay upright. They were arm in arm and, you know, they're hurting, but they have to stay out there because they have very few players. And if they didn't go out, they would lose that, you know, $10,000 in today's money. So they weren't going to chance that. Now that Georgia Tech was up by over 100, pretty much everybody got in on the action, including big offensive tackle Canty Alexander. Yeah, he was the teddy bear of the team. Everybody loved him and everybody loved to pick on him. And he was a senior that year, and they said, guys, let's, let's give this guy a chance to score. So what would happen is the running back would run, run to the one-yard line, he stopped, and he kneeled. And this happened the game before this game here. And then when they, they centered the ball to him, all his blockers fell to the ground, and the defense rushed in and, and creamed him, you know, and he got really mad at him because it was a joke they were playing on him. Well, they did the same thing at the Cumberland game. Uh, uh, the running back stopped on the one-yard line, kneeled, and they lined up and put him in the backfield. In this big lug, they centered the ball right to him. And then they played the joke, dropped to the ground. But this time, Cumberland dropped to the ground. And he was so excited, there was no obstacles in the way. He dropped the ball, kicked it, and you know, had to follow it into the end zone and jumped on top of it and scored his first touchdown. George Allen, coach, team manager, leader. As a student, he could have played every down. But George was no fool. He saw what was happening to his team. He wanted no part of it. Finally, late in the game, the leader of Cumberland entered when he ran out of healthy players. George didn't go in very much, but when he did, you know, problems arise and he made situations worse. One time he went in uh, to be a punter. He kicked the ball, hit the center in the back of the head, and the other team jumped on it. And another time he went in, they pitched the ball to him. Well, the running back, you know, he turned to the guy who pitched the ball to him and pitched it back. And said, you know, and then the ball fell on the ground and it fell over there and rolled by George's foot. 
And I think it was Leon McDonald said, George, pick it up. Georgia Tech was coming in on him. And George stepped away and said, you dropped it, you pick it up. And that was the actual quote that some of the players said they heard George say. The clock ran down. It was a total defeat. The Tech players saw the scoreboard, but few realized how significant it was. Heisman wasn't happy after the game. Yeah, he didn't know really get in shape in that game because they didn't have any opposition. So he made them practice so they'd be ready for the next game. In 1956, 40 years after the game, the two teams got together for a reunion dinner at the Greater Atlanta Club. One of the Cumberland players summed it up by saying, This is one of the great thrills of my life. I haven't seen many of these men since 1917, and this chance to relive this game is something I shall never forget. Thank you for making one man happy. As the years went on, the players began to realize that the score of this game was never going to be equaled. Cumberland may have lost the game, but the school was forever grateful to the team. When the pain started to fade away, you know, they started to think a little bit, you know, we're part of history now. So I'm sure they had a little pride that they did that, but they saved the Cumberland Law School. Dean George Griffin spent his entire life serving Georgia Tech. Even with all of his many accomplishments, he began to realize how important this one event was in his life. Dean Griffin was one of the quarterbacks there. And I remember I finally got to meet Dean Griffin. Very sweet man, very humble. And he said you know, during the game that you didn't think much of it. And you know, after the game, they didn't know how great a, a historic event this was. But when he read them, we gave him a manuscript so we could get a quote to put on the back of the book. When I met him, he was teary-eyed and he said, just thank you. <laughs> so you could tell he appreciated <clears throat> us putting a book together like that. It was really emotional. Now, over a hundred years later, thanks to a comic book cartoon, we still know the crazy story of the most lopsided game in football history. My name is Andrew. I hope you've enjoyed watching. This is our first episode. If you want to see more like this, please hit the subscribe button so you'll know when we bring out new content. Thanks!